Hey, you're here with Dr. Jody, and this is season two of Anxiety. I am so done with you. This podcast is a teen and young adult guide to ditching toxic stress and hardwiring your brain for happiness. If you're new here, grab a copy of my book, Anxiety, I'm So Done With You, because this series is following section by section through the book, going a little bit deeper, giving more examples and telling more stories. Season two, which follows along with chapter two, is going through the lies that anxiety, depression, and negative thinking tell you to get you to believe them. Once you know what they are, you can see them coming a mile away and call them out. That way they can no longer sucker punch you with their toxicity. I appreciate you for listening, subscribing, and leaving me five stars on Apple Podcasts. If I've helped you at all, spread the word about this book and this podcast series. Mental health problems are invisible, so you never know who is struggling around you, and you sharing can make a huge difference in their lives. Welcome to chapter two, lie number six, you can't trust anyone. Grab your notebook and pen, y'all, because I'm going to lay down some information that will change your life for the better. Because when you're a social being, like all humans are, you need people. So this lie that you can't trust anyone is going to mess you up. If anxiety convinces you that you can't trust anyone, then it's convincing you that you don't need anyone. But you do. You need people because people need people. Individualistic ideas hurt people. One, because they're impossible to maintain, so you feel like a failure. And two, because they make you isolate yourself and then you're alone in your head with your negative thoughts. Not a good place for anyone. Isolation, even when it's self-inflicted, makes us feel unloved, untethered, without a purpose, and lonely. Sometimes being alone when you have me time is good. You recoup and rejuvenate. But that's not what we're talking about here. The flavor of isolation is totally distinct. It feels different to your mind and your emotions, like you're unheld. You might be isolating because your anxiety says, stay alone, it's safer there. No one can hurt you. But the isolation hurts you so much more. It keeps you from good, uplifting relationships. And what's worse is that it makes you feel so bad about yourself that you attract people who treat you badly. And then you have no community to get you out of those relationships. So in a way, isolation breeds more isolation. In my practice, I've come to understand that isolation is one of the worst things for people. When I have a young person sitting across from me in my office and they say, I don't care if I ever feel better. The first thing I think is that they are severely isolated. People often mistake not caring about anyone or not caring about feeling better or not being interested in anything anymore as symptoms of depression. But I see them as neurological symptoms of isolation. You see, in isolation, your dopamine stops releasing. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter, like a hormone, that makes you feel good. When you're in isolation, you have nothing exciting happening, just a lot of negative thoughts tumbling over themselves in your head. So you have little to no release of dopamine. Your body gets used to not having it and it doesn't really care if it has it again. When dopamine goes off, you're like, that feels good. I want more of that. And you do it again. And then the dopamine goes off again and you're like, that's awesome. I want to do that again. And so you do it again. But when you're in isolation, it doesn't go off for a while and you stop caring whether it goes off again. You're not used to it. You might feel like your mind is atrophying and that you can't concentrate on anything. Did you ever feel like that? I know it's freaky and it feels like there's no hope and that you're losing yourself, but it comes back. I promise all you need to do is trigger the dopamine. Yeah, I'm saying it like it's easy and it's not because you probably have a lot of resistance right now to doing anything since that calorie saving resistance that we spoke about in the last episode, that kicks in big time here as everything, everything is gonna feel like a waste of energy, but it's not a waste of energy. You need to override this because you will feel better if you get out of isolation. 
And at first it feels scary and uncomfortable and that could feel out of control. But once you're out, you start to feel better and it could take a little bit of time, but you will feel in more control, not less after a while. It's hard enough to do this, but it is harder to do it alone. It really helps if you have someone to help you get out. After some brain stimulation, you will leave the negative spiral of the monkey mind and come back to feeling more like yourself. Okay, back to needing people. People isolate because they don't want to feel needy. They think that humans are not supposed to feel needy. However, the more people try not to be needy, the lonelier and more negative they feel about themselves and the more unloved they feel. And so the more needy they become. And then when neediness is not satisfied, it could come out sideways and cause drama in relationships that you do have. Listen, regular people are needy, not a person with something wrong with them. People in general are needy. So you could stop judging yourself for your neediness. When you allow yourself to be needy, you can seek companionship before it escalates and gets out of control. Relationships are mutually beneficial. You get your needs met while giving someone else what they need. I had a client recently whose anxiety had her avoiding school. She really wanted to complete high school, but she would freeze in the morning and then decide to stay home. Unfortunately, this girl had experienced a lot of trauma and that influenced how her anxiety made her want to stay home. Her anxiety is completely understandable but also it was hurting her more. That feels like the same thing. And of course, anxiety is brought on when we experience trauma, but sometimes they are two different things. While we worked on the trauma recovery and therapy, I was also interested in her getting to school as soon as possible. I knew it hurt her and her recovery more not to go. For one, healing happens in relationships, not in isolation. So the trauma recovery is much slower. But also, after some time of not going, school became scarier and scarier, and so it was harder and harder and harder for her to go. She said, I can't go to school because I don't feel comfortable around people anymore. You can think about this as being from the trauma, and of course, that influences her feelings about people, but she had been around people and comfortable around people since the trauma when she was used to being around people. This fear of people didn't start until she stopped going to school for a period of time. I'm telling you this because it's important how we make meaning around our fears and our anxieties. If she thinks of it as from the trauma, it'll motivate her in a different way than if she thinks about it as from the isolation. When she thinks her fear of people is from the trauma, she thinks people trick her and that she must stay away from people. She says, I isolate because I'm afraid of people. When she thinks this and says this, the truth in her mind is that people are scary. This is not a true statement. Some people are scary, sure, but her anxiety tells her that all people are scary, period. So she doubles down on isolating to protect herself. She is not safe in her monkey mind. She is so much worse there. I told her being scared of people is not causing you isolation as much as your isolation is causing you to be more scared of people. If you get out of isolation, you will be less afraid of people. I reminded her of when she had recently been around people and how that was okay and that we've seen that pattern over and over. When she's around people more, she's more comfortable with people. And when she's isolated more, she's more afraid of people. I knew about this phenomenon because I'd seen it play out with so many of my other clients. I knew from all of them that getting out of isolation had saved their lives and I wanted to save hers too. Okay, back to this section of the book and the lie, you can't trust anyone. If you've been hurt a lot, I am feeling you in this section because many of your experiences feel like proof that people can't be trusted or that you deserve to be treated badly or that you're picking the wrong people. Real answer is that in general, people are limited. Remember, everyone, everybody has that shabby self-esteem. They're all dealing with the negativity in their own heads, which while invisible to you is there, I promise that it is. Some people's misery is so big that it overflows. We can call these difficult people. 
Difficult people can range from just being negative and crabby and plain devil's advocate all the time, all the way to being narcissistic and controlling. And then there's so much in between. You for sure have to handle these differences in various ways. And in the book, I share my best secrets to dealing with difficult people and I give you some practices for you to try. What did you think of the energetic eye roll? I love that one. If you liked it, I made another longer energy shield training video that has the techniques explained a little bit deeper. You could get that in the blog post that goes along with this episode. The link is in the show notes. The biggest reveal in this section, in this discussion, in this episode about not being able to trust anyone is that the only person that you have to learn how to trust is yourself. When you are taking risks to be around people, knowing that people are limited and can hurt you, it'll be easier if you trusted yourself. When you trust yourself, you won't give them as much power over you or you won't give them any power over you until you can trust them. You'll take your time observing them to see if they're truly kind. You'll spend time getting to know them before you're vulnerable with them. There are good people out there. And when you feel better about yourself and build trust in yourself and have confidence in yourself, you will vibrate higher and then you'll feel more of a match to higher vibrating people. Don't worry, in chapter three, I go deeper into how to develop that self-trust. But for now, it's important to know that when you work on the relationship with yourself, it will make a difference in how you feel about other people. One of our biggest fears is that people will judge us or see us or call us out for our inadequacies. But when people judge you, they're judging you because of their own fear of being called out for their own perceived inadequacies or they're trying to project away from their own perceived inadequacies. You know those people who put other people down to make themselves feel better? That's what I mean. Basically, again here, our fear of our inadequacies is what holds racism, ageism, sexism, heterosexism, abled bodyisms, and more in place. It's people's misplaced fear of their own powerlessness. This is why people abuse people. And I'm not talking about people who are psychotically violent or psychopathological. I'm talking about people who are controlling and abusive, but seem like regular people sometimes. We call this narcissistic and it has become such a buzzword. But I want you to think about narcissism as a kind of anxiety. Not everyone who has anxiety is narcissistic, but everyone who is narcissistic has anxiety. Someone who is narcissistic feels a huge anxiety about being powerless, and they overcompensate to the point of obsession at times, either convincing everyone that they're great or a victim in order to control people in situations. They are very self-centered, and people in their lives only matter for what they could get from them. When they get nervous, they control people to regulate those emotions, and they could be really skilled at subtly making you think it is you that is crazy. I'm going to embed my red flags video in the blog post that goes along with this episode in case you're listening and it's reminding you about someone in your life. The link will be in the show notes. I'll also embed my drama triangle video in there. It goes along with trusting people because people often try to engage you on this triangle. And once you know it, you will not feel crazy anymore and you'll know what to do. Understanding the drama triangle will help you deal with difficult people your whole life. It illustrates types of disruptive interactions that cause conflict. On the drama triangle, there are three roles that people engage in to manipulate others, the persecutor, the victim, and the rescuer. For example, when they're in a victim role, they might accuse you of hurting them as if you're the persecutor, or they act like it's an emergency so you could be the rescuer or they wanna rescue you or put you down. Any of that sounds familiar, you'll find that video in the blog post too. Okay, I'm going back to the discussion about judging and I really apologize for my tangents, but there's so many caveats here when I'm talking about people and relationships because there's so many different scenarios and you have to do different things depending on what's going on. So thank you so much for sticking with me through this. Back to judging. If people are judging you, know that they are holding themselves to higher standards than they are holding you to. They are not happy people. 
knowing this can help you not take what they're doing so personally because it's not about you. And it might actually have you have some compassion for them. Having compassion for them does not make you vulnerable because it's not making you available for them to hurt you. Having compassion for them puts you in a power role where they cannot hurt you. And it protects you from giving what they say meaning. It's like they're judging you and you say, oh, poor thing, that's so sad. Can you see that that doesn't make you vulnerable? And it doesn't say that it's okay that they did that to you. It's not okay that they judged you. It's not okay that they're mean. And yes, you can have compassion for yourself too. But when someone judges you and it hurts you, say they say, your voice sounds funny. Have a little check-in with yourself. It's not okay that they did that. And I hope someone calls them out for it or you call them out for it. But right now, I'm helping you feel better after an attack like this. If someone insults you, it hurts more when they've hit a button that you're sensitive about. Like if someone mentions your body and you're sensitive about your body, this will be more keenly felt. If they tease you for a small rock in the corner of your yard that you didn't even know existed and you have no shame about the rock there, you wouldn't feel bad. You'd look at them like they were crazy. But if it was something you're sensitive about, it would feel horrible. This is what you do. If someone says something to you that's really hurtful, first, get away from them. Get somewhere safe immediately. Then have some compassion for yourself. Have some compassion for that soft human because of course it's going to hurt you. What they said hurts. And then find out if you're sensitive about it for some reason. And then think about making peace with yourself around that thing. This is an opportunity to drop some of those negative self-judgments that you have about yourself. We're going to talk a lot about this in later episodes, especially in chapter four. I feel like that's enough to chew on for this episode. You've been listening to Anxiety, I'm So Done With You with me, Dr. Jody. In this episode, we talked about needing people, trusting others, trusting yourself, identifying narcissists, and dealing with people judging you. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for listening, commenting, subscribing, and sharing and especially for giving me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That really helps this series get into the ears of more people that need it. You know how I feel about this devastating mental health crisis among young people, and we have to do everything that we can to change the tide. The next episode will be a deep dive into the last section of chapter two, lie number seven, you can't period. Read or listen, and I'll see you there. And in the meantime, come on and hang out with me on TikTok at Dr. Jody.